And uh, you might have just been notified there that the meeting is uh, being recorded. Um, the recording will be uh, made available via the Gilbrea Center YouTube page after the seminar. So if you don't wish to be in the recording, please turn off your cameras now. Um, welcome and thank you for attending the second seminar of the Gilbrea Annual Seminar Series. This series creates opportunities for the exchange of ideas and stimulates discussion amongst researchers, graduate students, undergraduate students, community members, and older adults. This year, our seminars will be exploring the theme aging, inclusion, and embodiment. We are thrilled to have Dr. Barb Marshall with us today to present a seminar on digital technologies and the shaping of aging futures, a critical research agenda. We ask uh, in terms of uh, just uh, uh, the way we want to progress and our structure that you keep yourselves on mute during the presentation. This is to avoid background noise. Barbara will present for about 45 minutes and we'll leave the last 15 minutes for a question and answer session. Feel free to type your questions into the chat box at any time and we'll read them on your behalf during the question and answer session. Or during the Q&A, you can unmute yourself and ask Dr. Marshall directly. Uh, so in terms of a biography, well, Barbara is a, a professor of sociology at Trent University. She's the recipient of Trent's Distinguished Researcher Award. She teaches, researches, and writes in the areas of gender, sexuality, aging, and technologies, often with her colleague, Stephen Cass. She is currently involved in two collaborative research projects on aging and technology. The first, a, a Digital Culture and Quantified Aging, explores the ways that emerging digital technologies quantify, track, and reshape measures of age. The second, Being Connected at Home, investigates contemporary experiences of later life at the intersection of digital infrastructures, place, and the experience of being connected. I know that we can't hear each other because you're on mute, but please join me virtually in welcoming Dr. Marshall. I see Great. some claps there as well. So take it away, Barbara. Thank you. Uh, and let's hit this little button. Thanks uh, very much for that introduction, Gavin. Um, I'd like to begin with um, a land acknowledgement. Uh, I know that McMaster is on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe. Uh, and I would like to respectfully acknowledge that I come to you today from the uh, unceded traditional territory of the Comox First Nation on beautiful Vancouver Island. And I hope that wherever you are beaming in from today, you'll take a moment to uh, think about the land that you're on and uh, appreciate the stewardship of that land by uh, First Nations. So I'm really excited to speak to you today. Um, I'd like to thank Gilbrea for the invitation. Uh, and I just want to note at the outset that I've prepared a uh, printed list of references and web links and things that I'm going to mention um, today. So you don't have to worry about uh, uh, furiously copying them down. And you can either get that from me or I think it'll be posted alongside uh, the presentation. Um, on the website. Uh, I know it's customary to um, thank all your um, uh, collaborators and uh, uh, colleagues at the end of a presentation, um, but I'd like to do it up front today to emphasize that what I'm presenting today is really built on the work of many colleagues, uh, many co-authors, uh, draws on um, multiple projects, uh, including projects supported by SHRC, CIHR, um, the ACT uh, Technology Partnership. And while I'm obviously responsible for any shortcomings in what I present today, uh, other people deserve the credit for uh, anything you find uh, that's of value or for much of that. So our work today spans um, a number of distinct projects and activities, although they're interrelated. And these include visual and discourse analysis of technology, marketing, and information materials, focus groups, uh, interviews with older people, 
to facilitate discussions about what technologies they use, enjoy, imagine, resist, uh, focus groups with younger people to explore how their own technoscapes uh, in later life, what, what those might look like. And soon we're going to start interviews with some technology um, designers and influencers. We've also engaged in some ongoing reflection, a lot of ongoing reflection about what this all might mean for aging futures and future research on aging and technology. And as a co-editor of a forthcoming collection, I've also had the privilege of being able to, to read and reflect on some of the most exciting research that's coming out on intersections of aging and technology. Some of our activities, how did I go backwards there? Uh, some of our activities such as focus groups and interviews have been seriously disrupted by the COVID pandemic and others such as the designer interviews uh, are in early stages uh, so rather than report on, you know, any specific project today, though I'm going to provide some examples from uh, these as we go along, I want to take the opportunity to engage in some broader uh, kinds of reflections on the role of digital technologies in the imagining of um, and the shaping of aging futures. And I want to suggest some questions that might deepen um, a critical perspective that draws from both age studies and science and technology studies. Uh, and both of those are quite interdisciplinary. So uh, that might give you a hint of where I'm going here. So it's a bit of a roadmap um, uh, on what I'm going to cover. Uh, I want to start with some background context on the current enthusiasm for uh, Geron technologies or technologies that are designed to help you're going to see a lot of air quotes here, uh, older people uh, and or their carers. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the concept of a socio-technical imaginary. Uh, and this is a theoretical concept that I found very helpful in framing some of the discussion that we're going to have. And then I'm going to outline some sort of key themes in critical research on aging and technology, some themes and issues that might help us think about shaping a critical research agenda. And then finally, I want to introduce the idea of socio-geron technology as a promising interdisciplinary enterprise. Let's start then with why there's so much contemporary interest and enthusiasm for geron technologies and in particular digital technologies. Well, this is, uh, you know, demographic changes and development in technology are both really relevant here. Now, we're probably all familiar with the changing demographics of Canada and uh, other Western nations, uh, which are uh, showing a, a larger proportion of the population uh, living into old age and living uh, longer. We're also familiar with the proliferation of digital technologies in our lives, in everyone's lives. So it shouldn't be any surprise that they're also going to become more prevalent in older people's lives. And these two trends really come together in thinking about the future. But as my um, colleagues, Alex Payne and Louis Nevin out of the Netherlands argue, aging and the future are um, intimately related, whether we're imagining our own future or the future of uh, our aging society, but more often than not, it's not presented as a very positive image, but that of some kind of a looming crisis that needs to be averted. Um, and this tends to frame the dominant discourses on aging and technology, such as that conveyed in that, you know, uh, terrible metaphor of the, the tsunami that of needy and vulnerable elderly that are going to, you know, drain the public purse and swamp the futures of, of younger generations. And this, this crisis account of aging really grounds the urgency with which interventions uh, are called for. And technology is seen as pivotal here. So investments in technology to support aging have grown massively across the globe and have become core goals of both national groups such as Canada's AgeWell, and supernatural bo uh, super national bodies such as the European Community, the World Health Organization, all advocating massive investment in uh, gerent technologies. The assumption here 
is that, that technological development can not only help older people, uh, but it will deliver significant cost savings to offset this you know, impending disaster of care costs. And we'll also offer opportunities for uh, the development of capital and savvy investors. So what has been called the silver economy is expansive and encompassing. This is uh, one of Agewell's maps and it includes, I don't know if you can read this on your screen, it includes housing, mobility and tourism, health and long-term care, well-being, prevention and self-care, citizenship and consumerism, which I find kind of an odd coupling, uh, but that's enough for a story. Uh, employment, education and training. This was, this was a very you know, expansive universe. Um, and it's, a, it's a very much of a future oriented perspective for seeing this new era of aging or this new era of connected aging as this report out of California puts it, uh, with the promise of all of these amazing technologies, uh, connected medical devices, sensors, fall prevention, um, you know, it, 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 it's an endless set of opportunities of technologically enhanced aging. Well, why digital technologies? Obviously the connections between aging and technology are not new. Um, eyeglasses, hearing aids, large button TV remotes, uh, canes and walkers. I mean, all of these are technologies that we have um, used for a long time to assist with some of the changes associated uh, with aging. But our interest is specifically in the proliferation of digital technologies because they're, they're unique in the sense that they have the potential to monitor and collect and share data and potentially monetize that data uh, and feed that data into algorithmic decision making uh, and feed that data into dividing practices divisions between young and old and frail and not frail and so on. And these may have real impacts on uh, people's lives. Now, digital technologies include a lot of things that are not age specific. So things like smartphones and Fitbit and you know, voice activated assistants like Alexa or Google. And these are things that are also used by older people in their everyday lives, but there's also a burgeoning industry devoted to gerund technologies or technologies that are specifically designed for uh, older people. So uh, all kinds of uh, uh, sensors and uh, care robots and uh, uh, fall monitors and all kinds of things. These are designed mostly to monitor, to manage risk, uh, and as well to mitigate isolation and assist in care. The key targets for gerund technologies. Uh, so all these devices correspond to various goals or aspirations for gerund te technological development and marketing. So promoting active aging, monitoring health. Devices here include fitness trackers, digital scales, devices to monitor heart rate, uh, blood pressure, or to tra track medications. And the overriding assumption in the marketing and development of these tools is that older people are consumed with their health. This is an assumption. Um, and I could give you lots of examples for marketing materials on that. And I wanna come back to that. Mitigating isolation, another uh, um, uh, key uh, goal. And a range of devices here from broadly marketed smartphones and tablets and associated messaging apps, devices, uh, that are specifically designed for older people, such as you know, special tablets and phones, uh, companion robots, virtual pets, again, a whole uh, lot of things. And then there are technologies that are specifically designed to support aging in place. Um, in addition to some of the devices I've already mentioned, these might include a range of assistive technologies like um, voice activated assistants that are connected to lights and doors and thermostats, uh, monitoring technologies, um, 
motion sensors, uh, smart refrigerators, and even smart toilets that uh, you know uh, measure and monitor how often you're evacuating yourself. Um, and then there's another realm of technologies aimed at supporting care providers. So both in-home and long-term care, data reporting and communication platforms for case planning and management, uh, geofencing to uh, restrict movement of vulnerable individuals. So quite a long list of things. Now, all of this fits what, again, I'm, I'm gonna um, cite my uh, colleagues, uh, Louis Nevin and Alex Payne here. Uh, they call it interventionist logic, where technology is pitched as what they call a triple win. It's good for older people. It improves their quality of life. Secondly, it's good for society because it promises to reduce the costs uh, of, uh, you know, by keeping people healthier, uh, living in their own homes longer, making care facilities more efficient. And third, benefits the economy as new opportunities for investment and invention and markets are developed. So, you know, win, win, win. Um, I'm going to problematize some of these assumptions, but I first want to take a little detour uh, into uh, the COVID pandemic and how it has, you know, highlighted uh, some of this. So I think the COVID pandemic has really brought into sharp relief the promotion of technological solutions for problems associated with aging. So, for example, the expansion of telehealth services, um, uh, video conferencing. And unsurprisingly, there's been uh, a focus on isolation and loneliness and the role of technology in solving these problems. And you've probably seen some of the media coverage of this. It's you know, been hard to miss. At the same time, the media coverage of this uh, uh, has, has really, I think, hinted at some of the shortcomings in that interventionist logic. So, my brilliant colleague, Sally Chivers at Trent, uh, has, has uh, recently published this uh, commentary on the, um, the conversation, which is a, a, a blog some of you may be familiar with. And in it, she notes the ageist tendencies in much of that media coverage, not just regarding technology, but uh, more generally about aging in the pandemic. So she notes the disjuncture between widely circulated images and stories focusing on older people as lonely and vulnerable and needy, and notes the lack of attention to the contributions that older people make to our communities in challenging times uh, like ours. So she muses, I'm not the only one whose hand-sewn mask was made by someone over 70 who got my bread recipe from a senior who sung in a choir led by a guy in his 60s who learned how to Zoom in a heartbeat and who followed streamed exercise classes led by a woman in her 70s. I do the same streamed exercise as Sally does, so I can attest to, the, <laughs> to that. Chivers also notes the tendency to speak of seniors as an undifferentiated group, for example, over 65 or over 70s, as if there is some great homogenization that uh, characterizes later life and overrides differences of generation, social location, uh, and so on. And another ageist notion that emerges out of this kind of coverage is this othering of older people as expressed, for example, in call outs to check on our elderly vulnerable neighbor, neighbors, as if those people are not part of the listening and reading audiences that these um, uh, stories are directed at, or aren't already checking on each other and their younger family and friends. Some of you may have seen this story in The Guardian last week. And this, this image of the sad older person, usually a woman, staring out the window is one that's become quite familiar. But note, note the disjuncture here eloquently pointed out by Tom Scarf, between the stock picture of the lonely older person they chose to illustrate this article and the data reported in the article, which suggests that younger people who are rarely characterized as needing more technology 
are more likely to be experiencing loneliness. Now that story has um, since been taken down from the Guardian site, uh, not sure why, but I think it's a good example of just how naturalized these ageist assumptions are. This depiction of older people as the other has also been noted by anthropologist um, Leslie Carlin in a fascinating presentation a couple of months ago uh, at another sort of a virtual conference. And I screenshotted one of her slides here because it, it really uh, uh, struck me where she highlights that despite age wells, at least token inclusion of older adults in uh, their work, the pronouns in their mission statement suggest the persistence of this us and them uh, division. So I think these observations really uh, start to get to the core of what are some of the problems with this interventionist logic. First of all, this us and them division, you know, the assumption that the old are not us, no matter how old we are, right? So <laughs> there's this, this us and them division. They become objects, not subjects. Secondly, there's this continuing association of aging as synonymous with decline, with vulnerability, with increasing need. And as Nevin and Payne note, that negative picture of aging is necessary to the interventionist discourse because without it, aging cannot be as effectively deployed as a social problem that needs intervention. And third, technological intervention is offered quite uncritically as inherently positive. And it becomes this, as again, to cite Nevin and Pence, it becomes a moral high ground. So how do we overcome or challenge some of these assumptions? How do we move towards a richer and more complex understanding of aging and technology? And one that doesn't see aging as simply a problem that shiny new technologies can solve. But that the moral high ground of this discourse makes it really hard to criticize it. So let me make it clear at the outset that I'm not against technology. Um, I use a lot of technology. I acknowledge the many ways in which technological, technological innovations can be very beneficial to aging individuals and, and to aging societies more generally. But this is not a one of those are you for it or against it questions. It, it's more a case, I think, of what kinds of questions do we want to ask about the relationship between aging and technology. The theoretical concept of sociotechnical imaginaries, I think, is really useful in um, framing the ways that certain questions or projects get taken up. And this, uh, Jasnoff and Kim define these as collectively imagined forms of social life and social order that are reflected in the design and fulfillment of specific uh, scientific and or technical projects. Okay, so they're, they're collectively imagined forms of social life and social order. And as Kelly Joyce elaborates, they highlight a society's core ideas about the role of science and technology in the present and in the future. And, notion, and she, in notions like, like successful aging, aging in place, anti-aging medicine, these all form socio-technical imaginaries. These are all uh, uh, ways of imagining um, that both the present and the future. Importantly, they're at the same time descriptive in that they um, describe uh, you know, what is um, and suggest what is possible, but they're also normative, right? They, they suggest what should be, um, what's desirable. So it's almost like a, you know, that descriptive normative distinction is almost like a, a fact value distinction, right? What, what is, what is possible and you know, what should be. 
here's one socio-technical imaginary that's organized around the idea of successful aging. Um, this comes from West Health, and it's an American foundation research and policy complex that's focused on aging. And the, the idea of successful aging here links smart home technologies, wearable technologies, um, data transfer, connective technologies into this um, world, into this uh, sphere that you know covers almost every aspect uh, of an aging person's life. So as described by uh, Jasnoff and colleagues, socio-technical imaginaries as, a, as, a, as a, a theoretical tool, right, a thinking tool, offer a way to map the, 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 the ways that visions of progress incorporate our ideas about the common good and our collective future. And they help us to explain, you know, why out of all the possibilities that exist out of that universe of possibilities, some visions of desirable futures tend to win out over others. So we need to get into thinking about values here. And I, and I want to come back to that question. So sketching the socio-technical imaginaries around aging might help us in uh, grasping how technological developments uh, are implicated here. And so we might ask, you know, how do they frame and represent the future? How do they enable or restrict different kinds of agency? And what are the alternatives? So as, as Kelly Joyce suggests in a forthcoming chapter, what would it look like to imagine elders as technology users instead of as problems to be solved. And that has really been the, the kind of touchstone idea of uh, our recent uh, research. So I want to briefly summarize here um, a few key points that uh, our research has suggested. And uh, I'll give you some examples really from our focus groups to date, but also thinking about the work that others have been doing on similar issues. Uh, so I wanna really call into question some of those assumptions of that interventionist agenda. So first of all, um, our participants reported using a multiplicity of apps and devices. They used smartphones, they used um, iPads and other tablets, um, laptops, e-readers, alert pendants, digital cameras, um, digital kilns, digital vaporizers, uh, apps for a wide range of activities, um, apps for meditation, for painting by numbers, uh, GPS apps for phishing, uh, online conferencing software. And, and interestingly, um, they were really big on YouTube videos for learning new things, right? For learning all kinds of, of different skills. Very surprising to us as researchers um, was that the use of technologies related to health concerns and risk management did not figure very centrally at all. And this really contrasts with the emphasis on monitoring, uh, maintaining, improving health in later life that the development and marketing of technologies to older people uh, focuses on. So that was, uh, I think, a really core finding for us. Secondly, while technologies were used, certainly used to connect, it was not necessarily their families or their caregivers that they were connecting with. A number of participants in our focus groups and, and uh, the ones who were in the public library in particular spoke of the different apps, um, WhatsApp, Skype, FaceTime, Instagram, that they were using in order to stay in touch with um, children and grandchildren, but they also use these apps to connect with peers and with broader communities. Um, for example, we had one participant who used video conferencing software to connect with church members uh, across the country. Uh, participants who were living in retirement residences 
uh, emphasize their use of digital technologies to stay in touch with and organize events among um, each other, amongst them, themselves in the building. So who was hosting a coffee uh, that day or you know, swapping a recipe for something? And I think it's worth noting as well that even when digital technologies are central to family connections, it may be as important for older adults to use them as part of their care for others as it is to permit others to care for them. Um, and, and this, I think, is something that's been shown in a number of, um, of other people's uh, research as well. Uh, I'm thinking back to research from 20 years ago on an ethnography of the internet done by Danny Miller and uh, Don Slater in Trinidad, where older uh, Trinidadian, particularly women, uh, took to email right away as a way of checking up on their kids who had um, migrated to Canada or the, the UK. Uh, there's um, a really interesting work out of Spain on the use of WhatsApp uh, as a, a, again, parents, older parents, uh, uh, checking up on or monitoring their, their adult children. And of course, the Grannies on the Net um, project, an international project out of the ACT network. So lots of examples that show it's, a, it's really a caring is a two-way uh, process um, in terms of the use of technology. And thirdly, I think contrary to the characterizations of older people as technological laggards who need to be you know, kind of dragged into this shiny new future, research suggests that many can articulate very clear reasons for their resistance to or rejection of particular technologies. So for example, again, from some of our focus groups, participants were mindful of the impact of their participation in the digital sphere. They were careful about how much time they spent online. Um, some expressed their awareness, I guess, uh, to put it, uh, of their finiteness um, of their time on earth uh, that made them want to spend less time sitting in front of a screen and more time you know, being present to quote one of our participants. Others mentioned cost as a significant issue. Uh, others were wary of their safety and privacy online. And there was also uh, expressed resistance to the labor that digital tools download onto individuals. I can't overstate how interesting and insightful our conversations with these participants were and, and how much they enjoyed speaking to each other as users, not as problems. Well, in the time I have left, um, I want to, uh, which is about the 10 minutes or so I have left, I want to highlight some key intersecting themes that I see as important in developing a critical research agenda. Um, so I'm going to highlight sort of three domains and, uh, and wrap it up. So the first is quantified aging. And the theme of quantified aging has been central to the work that Stephen Katz and I've been developing over the last 15 years or so. Um, initially, we noted ways that aging bodies and changes across the life course were becoming measured, standardized, treated according to a new logic of functionality. We extended this analysis into the ways that developments in self-tracking technologies um, and digital apps produced what we called sort of new modes and styles of, of aging with numbers. And our focus has been primarily on, on the rationalities that underpin these uh, technologies. You know, how age and success were being technologically produced through numbers. Uh, so big data, for example, you know, offers this kind of what promises to be or, or purports to be an objective way uh, of making decisions. You know, what we call aging by algorithm. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll give you some examples of that uh, in a minute when we uh, look at uh, uh, some of the applications. But work in digital sociology has highlighted the significance of what Coldry and Mayas refer to as a social quantification sector. And these, these enterprises ensure that this regular and seemingly natural conversion of daily life into a stream of data that can be appropriated for value. 
And this stream of data is extracted from the sensors attached to your bodies, whether that be a Fitbit or a, an alarm pendant or a, you know, motion, uh, motion sensors, the uh, objects that you interact with, the traces that we leave uh, online. And as they conclude, they say the result is a new social order based on continuous tracking and offering unprecedented new opportunities for social discrimination and behavioral influence. So as a simple example, think about your own digital breadcrumbs. Uh, mine are no doubt responsible for the targeted ads that are always showing up on my feeds, you know, telling me, you know, 10 mistakes that women over 60 make in putting on their, you know, <laughs> eyeliner in the morning. Right. And um, Kim Sawchuk has done a, 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 gave a brilliant talk on that. Uh, so, but as Stephen Katz and I have argued in previous work, this stream of data that, that is being generated and constantly circulating has the potential to shape new dividing practices between young, old, fit, frail, independent, dependent, and so on. It's what measurement is for. So Dave Beer uh, in Metric Power stresses that the reason that we measure things is to differentiate them, right? We diff then we use these measures, they circulate through policy, scientific, professional registers, and then they create possibilities for the way that individuals get sorted, treated, rewarded, and so on. So for example, your insurance company might offer you reduced rights if you share your activity monitor data or you agree to have a device installed in your car that uh, measures your speed and stopping distance. So the aging individual in this universe is at the center of all kinds of different connections to their, to their individual data, to others, to uh, the devices that uh, they're connected to, and to aggregate data, to population data. And this is a vast and complex set of, set of connections that I'm not going to have time to go into a great deal today. But we need to think of data as happening on more than one level. So on the one level, we produce data that might make us as individuals, uh, we might use to make decisions about our own health or something, right? Um, but it, it might constrain certain possibilities. So for example, if you have a fall sensor, how many falls does it take before you need to be, you, you get reclassified as someone who needs a higher level of care? The other level, the way in which we need to think about data is population data, where we use aggregations of that data to make decisions about particular uh, population groups. So, and we've, we saw this in, seen this in the um, COVID pandemic, where um, uh, po uh, population data has been used to argue for special measures to segregate or protect older people from being exposed to COVID. Now here's that vision again from West Health. Uh, and you can see again that this is a vision of continual measurement and circulation of data from those personal health technologies in the you know, optimize my health box uh, to the robotic companions, the sensors in the smart home uh, and uh, uh, the themed and caregiver monitoring. And this slide is also a nice little segue into the next theme which is aging spaces. Now, thinking about aging spaces has produced some really interesting interdisciplinary work in the last few years. I'm, and I'm particularly uh, intrigued with some of the recent materialist approaches uh, in age studies that in Stephen Katz's words, direct our attention to quote, various things, various places, technologies, things, rhythms, designs, mobilities, and environments in which our experience of aging is grounded and observable. And of course, Gavin Andrews' work has been very inter, uh, influential here. Of these interconnected spaces, I'm only gonna really touch on aging in place today for reasons of time, um, 
but I would re be remiss if I didn't draw attention to some work done by my colleagues that taps into these other spaces. So for example, our newest team member, um, Megan Graham, has recently published a really stellar piece looking at the securitization of dementia based on an ethnographic study of a secure dementia care unit in which she argues that technologies that monitor and restrict movement in those spaces contribute to redefining dementia as a security uh, issue rather than a health issue. Uh, and that really has implications for the ethics of dementia care. Uh, and her work joins other contributions that really critically interrogate the transformative potential of technologized care spaces. Um, Elisa Grigorovich and Pia Contos had a, a, a lovely recent article in the Gerontologist on this. With respect to the community, uh, our co-investigator Nicole Dahmer is doing really exciting work on how public libraries as public space uh, are important. And our focus groups, two of which we held in public libraries, uh, really underscored this as uh, public, technolo public libraries are really important technology hubs for people where they can access the internet, get assistance with devices and so on. Uh, I'm just going to briefly mention, because I noticed my time is running faster than I thought it would, as usual, uh, and we've been looking at um, smart homes, where we asked, uh, we've done this with two groups of younger students, uh, and um, unfortunately have not been able to roll out to the older groups we wanted to do to get a life course perspective because of the pandemic lockdown. And we asked um, students to imagine what their technoscape in later life might look like or what an older person's smart home might look like. And they came up with these wonderful um, technologized maps with sensors everywhere and all kinds of, they were really quite lovely. Um, but two interesting things that I thought came out of the initial discussion on this was that very few participants thought about where the data goes, who's monitoring those technologies, uh, and what happens to the data, you know, who's reading that. Um, and the other was when they were asked if they could see themselves living in that space, they were less than enthusiastic. While anecdotal at this point, this though resonates with other research, such as that from Clara Barrage, uh, that um, uh, demonstrates that parents and their children don't always have the same uh, enthusiasm for monitoring technologies. The other piece of work we've been doing is to look at aging in place in uh, policies, in uh, different policies. And we have uh, collaborated with colleagues in the Netherlands and Spain to do uh, an analysis of um, uh, the place of technology in uh, uh, government documents, basically policy documents. Uh, we focused here on values and we identified a range of values uh, that frame technological innovation and um, certain clusters emerged from each country, even though there was quite a bit of overlap. The Netherlands focused on technology and care, Spain focused on technology as promoting autonomy and Canada focused on uh, technology and connections. Uh, I, I can't, I don't have time to go into some of the uh, um, fine points here. So I'm just gonna kind of go to the reason that we found this interesting uh, is because these value, these assumptions, the value assumptions are often unarticulated. And we wanna argue that those need to be uh, unpacked and contextualized if we're going to avoid making universal claims about the inherent value of interventions. And making explicit these values is really important to the role of social policies in imagining aging futures. So I'm gonna, you know, putting on my Weberian hat, um, values need to be articulated so they can be a matter of, of political debate. And this opens a window also onto some larger questions. Uh, Nora Keating in her keynote to the recent Aging and Social Change Conference uh, noted that in Canada, values about families are important in, as a backdrop to policy development. We count on family members to provide care, but we're less forthcoming 
about supporting them. So those kinds of values need to be brought out and um, debated. So future challenges. Um, I think there's a lot of larger questions, important challenges for developing a critical agenda here, but I'm also really excited by the growing interest, the research, the resources that might be brought to bear on these. Uh, I think these include new materialist approaches to space and place that might produce more imaginative renderings of space. Reconsiderations of vulnerability and care that are rooted in feminist studies, disability studies, anti-racist and anti-ageist work. Uh, are these are really incredibly important in pushing us towards a more robust critique of power. And as a sociologist, my gaze is always on the larger social patterns, the divisions, the processes that frame what are often posed as the problems of individuals. And technological interventions on their own cannot address these. So I want to leave you with this question from Kelly Joyce and colleagues who ask, what if we imagined old age as a place of exploration where people can explore creative and communal activities in collective public spaces and elders are imagined as subjects instead of uh, objects of study? And these are the kinds of questions that are central to uh, the enterprise of socio-gerent technology. Uh, I'm, I, the links to this website, which is a great resource of uh, um, international scholarship, are in the uh, little handout I prepared. Um, and, and that's one really great resource. And at the risk of shameless self-promotion, <laughs> this is the uh, edited collection I referred to, which is coming out in uh, February 2021. And uh, in the interest of preserving at least 10 minutes for questions, I'm going to call things there. And again, remind you that I have uh, a nice little printed up sheet that I can send you or you can download. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Barbara. That was an excellent talk. And I'm sure if we were there in person, we'd all be clapping right now. <laughs> Boy, time flies when you're talking now. <laughs> I looked at the very, clock and went, oh my God. Very, oh, look, we have some claps as well. I'm very, very, <laughs> yeah, really, really quite interesting. I certainly have um, a, a couple of uh, questions, but uh, I would like, though, to uh, open it to the floor and um, either write your question into the chat box or um, give me a wave and, uh, I, uh, and unmute, your, unmute yourself and ask a question. Meredith unmuted? Uh, I'm just saying. Uh, yes, Meredith, did you have a question? Oh, sorry, I'm having some. Okay, while people sort themselves out, uh, because I'm trying to find the message box at the moment, I can't see any. Equity, if you see any. Um, uh, messages, uh, questions in the message box, uh, let me know. Okay, so um, I have a question. Um, you know, really when, when, when high tech started to, to emerge in the, in the sort of mid to late 90s, I was just getting into academia, just finishing my PhD, and there really seemed to be a, a, an almost an automatic negative reaction amongst particularly critical and cultural uh, gerontologists to these new technologies. There's a lot of Foucauldian scholars emerging at the time, you know, um, post-structuralists, and they were really concerned with surveillance and monitoring. And the, I remember witnessing a lot of arguments between gerotechnologists and critical gerontologists. And I, I just know, I, I've got the feeling, I don't know about you, Bob, that, that we are changing as, as gerontologists, our opinions over time. Maybe we're becoming a little bit more realistic and pragmatic and getting ourselves involved with the technology so like you are, rather than reacting. And, and, and I wonder if you've just experienced that sort of change in the discipline yourself. 
That's a, that's a really great observation, Gavin, because I'm, I mean, I'm still concerned about surveillance <laughs> and I mean, there's still a lot of concerns, but what I, where I think the turning point has come has been in a real breaking down of that us and them. And, and, and I say that as someone who is in the demographic of, you know, over 60s, right? So, and, and this it's, it's kind of ironic sometimes when, um, uh, and uh, uh, Leslie Carlin noted this in her presentation, you know, a lot of the people she, she sees speaking about old people in technology are themselves, you know, over 65, you know, late life academics. So I think the breaking down of this, that us and them, um, I think it has been important in critical work. And I think also we have seen, and, and certainly that, that edited collection that I worked on with, with um, Louis Nevin and Alex Payne and Wendy Martin um, really had us thinking through how much the, the turns in both age studies to thinking about materialities and thinking about uh, technology and the turn in science and technology studies to thinking about age. I think the turn has been more fully taken in age studies than it has in science and technology studies, um, but, 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 but they're important. And as you know, Alex, uh, uh, Gavin, these, um, these conversations are ongoing, you know, uh, 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 and I think are, are changing on a daily basis. Um, but yeah, I think there's also been, I think you mentioned high tech. And I think one of the other things that's come out of some of the, the recent research is, is a need to maybe move away from valorize, valorizing high tech over already, you know, maybe existing or lower tech uh, things. And Alex Payne gives a really great example in one of his pieces, I, I can't remember what it is, of a, uh, a, an older woman who plays um, a Dutch equivalent, I think, of uh, Words with Friends uh, with her one of her sons. And it's one of those these things that you can play asynchronously. And when he adds a word to the, the game, she knows he's taking a break from work and will give him a call and chat, right? And, and if she hasn't added a word to her thing um, for a while, then he may, will maybe call to check on her. And this is a really kind of a low tech sort of thing that wasn't designed for as a caregiving technology, wasn't designed as a Jaren technology, but has been incorporated into people's lives to uh, accomplish that. So I don't know if that answers your question or not. Absolutely, and, and, and thank you for that uh, broader disciplinary overview. And that's actually just been followed up in the chat with a, a quite specific question along the same lines. And that is, what are your thoughts on Jaren technologies and surveillance stroke potential breach of privacy that older adults may experience with these devices. For example, nursing homes with sliding bathroom doors or ringing doorbells that record all your motion. It seems common for these surveillance technologies to report footage, not only to administrators, but to, to uh, uh, older adults, children and families. Yes, and I, 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 I'm absolutely, um, uh, simultaneously fascinated and horrified by the potentials here. Uh, I just read an absolutely amazing short blog post. It's on the, it's posted on the Social Gear and Technology site by Clara Barrage. I don't know if some of you know Clara Barrage's work. She's um, out of University of Washington and uh, has done some, some really great empirical work on surveillance technologies and care. She just did a blog post on digital contact tracing that's being used in long-term care facilities uh, to it during the COVID crisis, right? As a, a means of contact tracing and really raises these kinds of questions. And she cited, I wish I had it in front of me. She cites one of the people she'd interviewed as saying that, that, that this is the definition of institutionalization, you know, that they're constant recording and monitoring. Um, well, when we asked our, our younger people, or I shouldn't say we, Kirsten Ellison, I can see is, is on the call and Kirsten um, facilitated focus groups with younger people on the home mapping exercises. And, you know, when, uh, and maybe she can pop in and tell me if I've got this right. But when she asked them, you know, would you like to live in this house? Yeah, they, 
weren't so keen on on being surveilled. So I think it's a it's a huge issue. But there's also, and I want to stress this, and we haven't had time to explore this. There's also an, a, a real issue of the labor of uh, care for the technology and care for the data. And it's not as if, you know, these technologies just, um, you know, work away on their own. Somebody, there, there's labor involved in making sure they're on, uh, making sure, you know, of monitoring the data, doing something, you know, it, it, there, it, there's a, a, an ecosphere that we're not really tapping into, I think. Thanks very much for that answer. Uh, and thank you, Alta Bennett, for that question. Um, please raise your, uh, unmute, or raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question or type it into the box. I do have a follow up myself. Um, even if you reframe, like the question of technology, like like you said, where, where we, we move from what, what do we need to give, what technology do we need to give older people to sort of what do they want and what can they make use of? It's, there's still ultimately the question of where's the limit, you know, for what we might call post-human aging, for the, for, the, for the technological support and sustaining of, of life in older age. Um, I mean, do we get to a point uh, where we start to, to erode the human and natural? You would think, you know, that's going to happen sometime in the future, whether it's two decades, three decades, four decades. You know, where, 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 does the, where do we start challenging the human? Or is there no limit? You know, do we just continue with technological support and innovation? Um, and it changes, that is the change, changing nature of aging. Yeah, and I think that is really a core to if we want to think of those socio technical imaginaries. I mean, I, I kind of looked at that successful aging as a, as a socio technical socio technical imaginary. But if we think about anti aging medicine as another one, um, that's a whole other set of questions. And my colleague um, uh, and uh, Kirsten Ellison is doing some really fascinating work and I think has. Uh, is going to probably be having a book coming out on this at some point on anti-aging medicine as as really raising those questions of at what point um, you know where, where do we where does the human um, technology Kirsten do you want to jump in on that I, I I can see her name there I don't see anything else um, um can you hear me yep, yep. Um, yeah, I think it's, they do intersect though, the, the successful aging and anti-aging. Mm -hmm. um, and it's whether or not we, we see it as, can we forever be improved? And is that the goal? Or is it about looking at our changing futures as a, this, I think Stephen talks about, you know, this vulnerability as being a human um quality across all ages and and whether you know we're actually denying this human essence of vulnerability and um, yeah and and i really think that's um that's something that's come out as i think in that example i gave around the the uh the COVID media coverage right that, that there's this shared vulnerability that is core to humanness and uh, Stephen's written about that. I mean, obviously, you know, Judith Butler has written extensively um, about that, and 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 I can't separate science and technology from the fact that this is a human and social um, process. Science is a social process um, that's engaged by humans. So. And, and again, I'm a sociologist, so I, I, I'm always asking myself, despite you know my enthusiasm for many types of technology, you know that they they can't address the the the, the complex factors, right? So um, I, I'm just struck by some of the things when I was doing interviews with people with Fitbits, older people using Fitbits, and uh, to support a kind of program of successful and active aging. Um, you know, what would allow them to um, be more active and engage in more healthy lifestyles were often things like 
is getting the bloody ice off the sidewalk so they didn't feel afraid to go out in the winter time or um, better scheduling through for their 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 medical facilities uh, people who were looking after partners who said, you know, I know I should get out and I should be more active and I should do this, but, uh, you know, I have to wait, they call, there's, you know, my appointment time's been changed. So these are things that technology uh, is never going to be addressed, that there is that, that, that kind of humanness. Um, social isolation and, you know, unsuitable housing, uh, you know, long-term care, and we've had a lot of discussions about long-term care in uh, again, during the pandemic has really sharpened these. And we know they're not going to be solved by technology. They're, they, you know, we can't solve the problem of, um, you know, poorly paid and poorly supported uh, workers, care workers uh, with technology. Uh, these are, and again, I want to go back to the question. These are questions of really trying to peel away and expose what are the values that are um, driving this and we need to debate those values and we can't talk about and debate those values unless you know we really uh, uh, let them get get that transparency uh, and unfortunately I think one of the values that we have let drive a lot of this has been austerity has been that that constant uh, uh, pressure of austerity policy Thanks very much for those responses and that additional information. It's really helpful. Um, we uh, are over time now by about three minutes. And, but um, I, if anyone has a very quick question, otherwise, I'm sure that, Bob, you would take uh, questions via email. Uh, Absolutely, if you yeah. Like yeah. If you want to follow up, I certainly have uh, additional thoughts as well I'd like to discuss with you over email. But I'd just like to wrap up by saying thank you very much again for that excellent, excellent uh, seminar and presentation. Um, and uh, uh, I, uh, I, I uh, thank you for, for coming at this difficult time and supporting our, um, our seminar series. Um, and I would like, yes, let's give a, a virtual clap to finish off. And, and back uh, at you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really sorry that we can't all go for a coffee or a glass of wine <laughs> or something. <laughs> that would be, yeah. I would like that. Well, thank you very much, Bob. And thank you very much for attending. Thanks very much for inviting me. Bye, everybody.